Okay, very good morning to you. Hope you had a great weekend. It is Monday, the 23rd of November. And I'm gonna start things off by just reminding you, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'd really appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel. Lots of new content even coming out over the weekend. And just to remind you then, I'm gonna give you a fundamental rundown now, both re uh, encapsulating the weekend's news flow, but also a look ahead for the major events for this week. But from a technical perspective, and kind of applying that into trading setups, then you can refer to our head of trader development, Sam North. He put out a video yesterday, you can see here. And then we also had on Saturday, the release of the third installment of one of our senior traders, Tim Duggan, who this time did a really great um, and practical interview, if you like, of good tips that you can apply to your trading uh, in regards to psychology. And he was speaking to a high performance psychologist uh, so really fascinating discussion there and something I, I definitely encourage everyone, whether you're just starting out or you're experienced, to, to have a look at. Um, but let's get straight into things and look at the charts this morning. There has been some breaking news just out on the tape a short while ago that has caused a little bit of a blip in price activity. You can see here the S&P had a little pop higher uh, before just being rejected around its R1. Uh, very short-lived, in fact, some of the gains. Um, but overall, another net positive. And what is it that I'm talking about? Well, it is this, which is AstraZeneca. Um, they've just come out with an update. Uh, the vaccine developed by the University of Oxford and Astra prevented the majority of people from getting the disease, but fell short uh, of the high bar that's been set by Pfizer and Moderna. So the actual uh, average efficacy was 70.4% when combining data from two dosage, dosage regimes. But do note though that one of those um, did have an efficacy rate of 90% when the approach which commences with half a dose was followed by a full dose administered at least one month apart. So I actually think that's a little bit more positive than perhaps some of the suggesting uh, breaking news that is coming out uh, over Bloomberg at the moment. Um, a couple of things to, to be aware of here. What does make the Astra drug a little bit different? It is a little bit cheaper. Uh, those other two, Pfizer and Moderna, have been criticized because of their high price point. Uh, the latter, Moderna, being uh, much smaller than, say, comparative to the Pfizer Astra giants that are very matured companies that have been around a long time. Uh, so obviously Astra then has good ability to manufacture and distribute any drug, which would be a net positive for them. And then also temperature. So the vaccine, this one that's just come out for um, for Astra, has and can be stored and transported and handled at normal fridge temperatures. That would be two to eight degrees and can be for at least up to a period of six months. So a couple of Big positives there, uh, and obviously this is the third big pharmaceutical company. It does come after we've also had uh, over the weekend, which was this one, uh, which is Regeneron. Uh, they've also come out uh, in pro early promise, if you like, in, in studies, keeping the infection in check, reducing medical visits in patients who get the drug um, early. So this is more in respect to not so much a vaccine, but some of the uh, pre-treatment situation. Um, and, and has come to notoriety, of course, because this was uh, part of what uh, US President Donald Trump was given at the time, which he contracted COVID-19. So a couple of things there to, to be aware of, and it has had a little bit of an impact this morning. Um, so T-notes have just bumped down a little bit after being hugging around the pivot level. Uh, oil was already in, in a fairly positive state at that point. Uh, irrespective of the Astra news, and we're up around 46 cents. So trading close to a $43 handle there. Uh, the dollar is weaker, uh, not much in the way of any sustained impact coming on the back of that Astra news. Uh, but if we look at both major pairs, they are trading in positive territory amid some of the dollar weakness. And of course, keeping a very firm eye on that dollar uh, in the Dixie, we're right back down to that lower bound of that key long-term level of support, which if broken, as we talked about many times last week, could have the propensity to see some quite extreme and rapid dollar weakness on an extension of that move. Um, otherwise, elsewhere, Sterling, a little bit of outperformance, perhaps a couple of updates I can go over in regards to what we can expect to hear from UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson later today as he unveils what the latest situation is, uh, what the intentions are for restrictions over the Christmas period. We've also got the Chancellor due uh, to update on government spending later in the week and obviously Brexit as well rolls on. Um, otherwise, 
Uh, in the gold market, things pretty quiet, uh, very tight price action. Uh, we're currently trading flat, in fact, at 1872 and a half. And, and one thing to remember, of course, in regard to the US uh, session, not just for today, but for this week as a whole, it is, of course, Thanksgiving happening on Thursday. And Thanksgiving means then that all US major markets are closed and typically people take off the Friday. Uh, so in terms of a normal working week in volume and also then from a North American point of view from a calendar, it's all pretty much front loaded. So worth bearing that in mind, a lot of the week's activity, barring anything unexpected, is likely to be uh, kind of front loaded uh, in that respect. All right, well, let's let's cycle through some of the news. And as I said, the Astra news has literally just come out. So it's definitely one to to keep an eye on, I'm sure people will further digest that and it'll be interested when the US come in as well to see how, how that goes down. But we've got a bit of a balancing act here at the moment between uh, really what is um, a worsening COVID situation against more positive vaccine developments uh, as more companies start to progress through their trial periods. So let's get you up to speed on what the COVID situation is. I'm gonna focus on, on the US uh, and then we'll also look at the UK and Europe. But starting with the US, uh, as you can see here, cases uh, over a two week change, up 54%, deaths up 64%, hospitalization rates up 50%. So the US recorded just over 177,000 new infections on Saturday. It is now averaging almost 110,000 more daily cases than it was uh, a month ago. And, and fa fatality, excuse me, have doubled over that same period. Um, vaccinations against COVID-19 in the US will hopefully, quote, start in less than three weeks. That was according to the federal government's program to accelerate the vaccine. And obviously this Astra one is going to be the latest kind of new positive news that has materialized. The interesting thing here about the Astra news is as positive as it seems on the surface, the market impact is becoming uh, less and less it's almost like the, the market is becoming desensitized now to some of these updates and the impact value, if you like, on, on, on day trading environments is becoming more and more um, kind of built in, I guess, to price. Um, an interesting thing, uh, a comment that I saw out of JP Morgan actually at the weekend, uh, they were saying that lockdown restrictions on the rise, as we know, and that's something definitely we need to keep an eye on, uh, given the impact that that can have on the, the national economy in the US. Uh, they also said that with restrictions on the rise, close to 10 million US workers are likely to lose their employment benefits at the start of next year. If you remember, this is because of the struggles that we've seen on Capitol Hill in order to get any sort of new fall rolling over of, of certain elements uh, of their stimulus package. And that amounts, according to JP calculations, to an income loss of around $170 billion uh, annualized. And I, and I think that's that's what's going to be really key here because at the moment the situation obviously is deteriorating. There's going to be a renewed amount of uh, unemployed people as we saw with the initial jobless claims taking a little bit of an uptick uh, from what otherwise has been a decelerating jobless figure um, is likely to pick up and intensify uh, and, and probably fairly sharply over the course of the coming weeks all the way through into the new year. Uh, and that in itself then uh, is it, definitely going to put pressure on uh, not just the uh, US government to come forward with some kind of idea about what they're going to do in timeliness of a, of a fiscal stimulus, but also putting pressure on the Federal Reserve. And this then lies to that kind of fundamental view of why we are still fairly bearish on the US dollar and that eventually we will break that level uh, and further dollar weakness may ensue. Uh, and that's because as well, one of the main talking points we had last week was about the Treasury stepping in, looking to rotate some of the underutilized kind of facilities from the Fed over into then um, what the, the government are doing. Uh, and this came out on Friday, which is worth recapping. There's now growing expectation then that the Fed are going to have to unveil more monetary action when it meets in a few weeks time in the middle of December. Uh, and that's after the, the Fed have come out uh, and Powell has basically said that they will comply with the Treasury Department's request to return unused funds meant to backstop five emergency Federal Reserve programs, uh, lending programs. Um, so the, the expectation then is the Fed are going to have to do more. And, and as I just mentioned, with the, the COVID situation, 
um, and the impact that that's going to have on unemployment and subsequently the economy with then the increasing level of, of lockdowns that will be witnessed on the state level, um, then the interesting thing from the asset class mix is that, you know, is that necess necess oh, necessarily a uh, negative for the equity markets? Perhaps not, because as we know, some of these pandemic kind of stay at home type names and uh, and obviously the tech space, these are very large companies, it can be supportive uh, of that. So this, this is what makes equity trading a little bit tricky right now. Uh, obviously the, the asterisk news comes in, the S&P and Dow European index, index futures might get a boost, but the Nasdaq typically falls because of that, that play that we've seen then, a, a kind of a rotational play into value, if you like, if a vaccine comes in. Uh, is the initial kind of knee-jerk reaction. But then actually, the other thing underlying at the moment is that COVID is getting worse, which is requiring more lockdowns, which then subsequently helps some of those tech stocks. So that's what makes that a bit of a, a tricky proposition at the moment to call the overall uh, direction. There's, there's much to be bearish and bullish about at the moment for the equity market. And that leads me into quite an interesting thing in terms of something else to be aware of. Uh, JP Morgan, again, uh, this coming uh, late on Friday, uh, but worth noting for the period ahead as we go going towards uh, year end. And this is that rebalancing flows may lead to an exodus, they say, of around 300 billion US dollars worth from the global um, stock indices by the end of the year, as large multi-asset investors need to rotate money into bonds from stocks after a strong equity performance has been seen so far this month. Uh, they go on to say that they see vulnerabilities in equity markets in the near term from balanced mutual funds, which represent roughly around $7 trillion worth, um, having to sell around $160 billion of equities globally to revert back to the target of 60-40 allocation, either by the end of November or by the end of December at the latest. You also... Uh, they say you need to contemplate that if the stock market continues to rally into December, there could be an additional $150 billion of equity selling into the end of the month pension funds that tend to rebalance on a quarterly basis. So, yeah, a couple, couple things worth bearing in mind there. And this isn't to do with anything to do so much with the news. If anything, it's a kind of a secondary uh, factor off of that because the news might inspire say vaccines the equity markets to rally let's say uh, but then these portfolio managers do need to rebalance at some point as they look to close out the year and revert them back to normal allocation kind of weightings and that can then inadvertently without any kind of bearish information result in quite a lot of extraction of capital out of the equity market which in itself then uh, can cause can cause some severe downside risk. So worth bearing that in mind. It's coming out from uh, JP Morgan on Friday. It doesn't mean necessarily uh, stocks are going to sell off today uh, or even this week, but something to keep in mind as we go further forward towards month end and then year end. Um, all right, a couple of other things then. Going to have a look at um, quickly this piece of news. Uh, this came out from a Reuters exclusive uh, overnight. The U.S. moves to ban technology exports to 89 ch Chinese firms. Uh, so Trump seems intent on making Biden's life as difficult as possible when he comes in. So some further escalation here on, on some of the tactical moves coming out of the U.S. Uh, on various different exports. Um, my overall interpretation of this is ultimately uh, as, as uh, provoking as this can be, I don't think China really will retaliate to a, to a high degree, given the fact that they know um, that Trump is outgoing. More of a just a formality, I think, now until it's more conclusive um, that that will take place in that interchange in the White House. So I don't think China will retaliate. So therefore, as a net consequence, I don't really see too much risk in this, this headline at this present point in time. The other thing then is about what's going on with COVID in the UK and Europe. Um, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is due to announce today, I think it was, I saw a headline 3.30, so later on this afternoon, uh, what COVID restrictions may be in place over the festive period. 
Uh, reports suggest several families could be allowed to join in one bubble and mix between the 28th, or excuse me, the 22nd to the 28th of December. Uh, the PM will also outline plans for a tougher three-tiered system for England to be introduced at the end of the current lockdown on the 2nd of December. Uh, an update from Sage, uh, their scientists apparently saying how ineffective the previous um, three-tiered system was and that this new one of which we are waiting details to what that will mean um, is going to come out later on today. Uh, under some of the new restrictions though has been some talk that the government is like to scrap the 10 p.m curfew on pubs and restaurants and obviously that hospitality sector has been one of the hardest hit um, since the onset of the pandemic of course. Interesting point though in terms of the economic implications on sectors like that um, so far, the, the lockdown that we have been on uh, is definitely going to have an impact, but nowhere near as close as to what we had back in March. Because if you think about those types of industries that were hardest hit back in the spring, they're the industries that, that largely have not yet recovered from the first blow uh, of the initial phase of the pandemic. So they're already in a fairly depressed state uh, to start with. So the economic impact is going to be less severe this time around. Um, otherwise, elsewhere in mainland Europe, things, um, a couple of hot spots of, of kind of general positivity and developments. France plans to ease lockdown measures in three steps as their infections continue to recede, uh, while keeping some restrictions uh, in place to contain uh, the virus. The first easing will take place around December 1st. Uh, Italy is considering temporary easing of soft lockdown uh, in the run-up to Christmas. However, the German approach, according to the Vice Chancellor, being a little bit more stringent, they're saying restrictions in the country may have to continue for some time beyond the end of this month in November. Um, quick look then at the calendar. What have we got for this week? As I mentioned already, it's going to be uh, quite front-loaded. And in fact, there's some important um, economic data coming out first thing this morning. So coming up now uh, in about an hour's time, we're going to get the flash manufacturing and service PMI data from the Eurozone and the UK. And, and these do tend to be market moving readings. So definitely keep your eyes out for that. Uh, we've got the Chicago Fed uh, National Activity Index later on this afternoon. We get the US PMI numbers. And then Bank of England, uh, Governor Bailey, Haldane, Tenreira and Saunders, they all speak before the Treasury Select Committee. Uh, so this is one of their kind of regular events, if you like. Uh, they'll be quizzed on the assumptions that underpinned their latest monetary policy report that they issued with the last uh, November uh, interest rate meeting that they had from the MPC. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak will provide a one-year spending review uh, together with updated economic forecasts from the Office of Budget Responsibility, the OBR, on Wednesday. And as far as Brexit is concerned, uh, there is no scheduled talks at the moment um, that I'm aware of, but obviously they're going to continue to be in dialogue. Uh, there hasn't been really major headlines that I can speak of that have developed over the weekend. It's something of which every week we go into the press and the politicians are kind of posturing that they're going to get a deal by, by, done by the end of the week. I still find that incredibly hard to believe personally uh, from a trading point of view. Uh, I guess some of the main things to be aware of here is that sterling, as far as sterling uh, dollar cable, is actually relatively high. We're trading above 133 handle at the moment this morning. And so the risk, of course, is to the downside deterioration because markets are priced for a, for a deal to happen at some point. Um, so that's the way I kind of interpret any rumors or headlines that, uh, as, they, as they break. Um, Otherwise, then having a, a look at the a quick summary then of these um, PMI data that are coming out, uh, they are going to be expected to be pretty dismal, in fact, because if you think about it, these are November readings. Uh, and so they, they're fully capturing then the depths of some of the renewed phase of lockdown that we have witnessed in Europe. Um, but as I said, uh, the one thing to bear in mind is that they're likely to have a much smaller impact than from the very severe implications of what we had the first time round, given that people are kind of more acclimatized now to what a lockdown entails. And also some of those areas like uh, leisure and hospitality uh, were only partly able to reopen uh, in this latest 
uh, kind of recovery that we've seen over the last few months. So the impact is going to be less uh, to the downside. But none, uh, nonetheless, I'll definitely keep an eye out for this. Moving over into Tuesday, you've got the German iPhone number. Uh, normally fairly interesting, um, talking to kind of the companies on the ground in Germany about their feelings of the current economic situation and more importantly forward looking what they feel and how confident they are about the six month horizon. Um, then you've got ECB's Christine Lagarde speaks at a virtual roundtable, uh, obviously being a fairly frequent speaker, um, obviously looking at this in two ways. One, given that she's speaking so regularly, it's unlikely there's going to be anything particularly new. However, we are mindful of the fact that come um, come the end of the year, the ECB are expected to boost their um, pandemic emergency purchase program. So looking out for further confirmation that is indeed going to be the case. Going into to Wednesday, that's when you get the OBR to publish their latest forecasts and, and the UK Chancellor unveils his latest one year spending review. You also get the US second reading of third quarter GDP looking to be unrevised at that sharp recovery rate of 33.1% that we saw. Um, you get your weekly jobless claims. Um, remember, because of the Thanksgiving holiday, they'll be coming out on Wednesday, so quite a busy day data wise there. Uh, you get your core PCE, personal income spending, and University of Michigan all then squeezed into that Wednesday. Some of those data points would have been normally later on in the week alongside also new home sales as well. Um, Speaker-wise as well, during these periods, uh, regional Fed presidents Thomas Barkin, Charles Evans speak on the economy today, uh, while James Bullard discusses monetary policy on Tuesday uh, as well. And one thing that actually has been left off this calendar really goes to show um, how unimportant it is, is you actually have the FOMC minutes coming out, uh, of course, later on in the week. Um, likely to be uneventful. Uh, nothing material really came of that latest meeting out of the Federal Reserve. Uh, but we do remain kind of mindful of this um, dispute that's been ongoing between Mnuchin and Powell about preserving the emergency uh, lending program. Uh, as we've seen, the, the, the Fed have kind of conceded then that they're likely to uh, adhere to the request of the Treasury, but that friction could be something to just keep an eye on uh, as we go further forward. Um, the final thing on the on the U.S. side is President-elect Biden. Uh, he will announce his cabinet picks on Tuesday, according to the press. Uh, Biden has also said last week that he'll decide who he will nominate for the Treasury Secretary and make that announcement around Thanksgiving, so this week. Um, some of the people on the shortlist for that most important position as far as financial markets are concerned uh, is actually the former Fed Chair Janet Yellen. Uh, she just can't go away and enjoy, enjoy her retirement, it seems. She's, she wants to get stuck in. Uh, so obviously a very familiar um, face and we know of her disposition when it comes to, to monetary policy. It certainly would be an interesting uh, situation if that was to materialise given it was only not so long ago that she was at the helm of the central bank and she does tend to have that more kind of dovish disposition. Um, then also the current Fed Governor, Leo Brainard, Sarah Bloom Raskin, a former Fed Governor, and Rafael Bostic, the President of the Reserve Bank of Atlanta, are all candidates in the, the running at the moment. Uh, Biden intends as, uh, to name his long-term advisor, Anthony Blinken, as the Secretary of State, according to three people familiar with the matter, and Jake Sullivan, formerly one of Hillary Clinton's closest aides, is likely to be named Biden's national security advisor uh, as well. Uh, then going into Thursday, obviously Thanksgiving, uh, and then Friday is Black Friday. And for any of those who are new to markets, it, it, it definitely is worth being vigilant on Friday for any updates that we tend to see in, in these more kind of real-time readings on how successful Black Friday is being from a retail sense. Um, given the fact that there's a pandemic and there's been an increase of online activity for purchases, we are expecting actually some pretty um, decent numbers uh, for Black Friday. So this will be closely tracked uh, as to give us an insight and a hint of the resilience of the consumer during this pandemic. Uh, and those numbers will probably be coming out as we go through the session on Friday. Uh, but as I said, Thursday will be particularly quiet from an overall volume point of view. It will, that will probably spill over into Friday, given that most most Americans will 
we'll, we'll take that as an extended long weekend. And so really it's going to be quite front loaded for this week. All right, going to leave it at that. Wish you guys a good week ahead. Any questions at all, feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'll see you same time tomorrow. Thanks very much.